All right, let's get started. We have a full program. My name is Markus Maurer, and it's my pleasure to be guiding you through today's symposium on Uticaria. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it still amazes me to see a, a huge room like this, full of you interested in Urticaria. That is not to say that you weren't interested five years ago or ten years ago, if you've been in the business for that long. But of course, there wasn't much to tell, really, if you think about uh, how devastating and how frustrating it was to treat this disease. And with all the new options that we have, diagnostic options, uh, treatment options, uh, this is an exciting field right now and uh, probably one of the most uh, exciting ones in dermatology overall. We have a distinguished uh, group of speakers here today. I'm glad everyone could make it. And uh, you will see that we built through the uh, next one and a half hours coming from uh, understanding the disease to understanding the, uh, uh, the solutions and giving you practical advice for when you go back on Monday and you see your next urticaria patient. Um, how many of you see urticaria patients? How many of you treat urticaria patients? Okay, that was just a check to see if you're awake. That's everyone. How many of you, or who of you, is looking forward to your next urticaria patient? Be honest. Okay, good. Two points. That's a lot more hands than came up last year. And uh, there's still a lot of hands that didn't go up. So there's room for you to be convinced that urticaria can be fun to treat. And this is what we will try to do. Uh, I have some uh, things to say to you, and I will try to... Um, to, uh, to, to, to say everything that's important. Now, you should know that this uh, uh, symposium is sponsored by Novartis. We thank Novartis for the chance of bringing us here together, for exchanging these ideas and for giving you this information. Uh, everything we say is our opinion. Um, what, are we, what are we doing? What are, what are we trying to do here? We are talking about chronic spontaneous urticaria, and um, we will be talking a little bit also about um, the different ways that chronic urticaria patients come and present. And this is just to remind you of your last chronic urticaria patient. You probably saw one earlier this week or last week. They're very common wherever we come from. And we see these pictures. And for a long time, um, it was uh, difficult to give good advice to, to these patients. Also because we uh, didn't really have a clear global classification. And this classification is to remind you that chronic urticaria with way more than 1% prevalence in all of our countries is divided in spontaneous and inducible ones. We will focus on spontaneous urticaria. It's the more, more common one. And many patients, you will find many patients with inducible urticaria also have chronic spontaneous urticaria. Here is, if you take home one sentence, let it be mine and let it be this. Treat the disease until it is gone. It's in the guidelines and it's my favorite sentence because it answers a lot of questions that we have when we deal with patients. It answers their questions. How long should I take these tablets? How long will this last? How long will I have to be treated? How much do I have to take? Um, this is a disease that's very chronic. Clive will tell you how long it lasts on average, but it is a disease that goes into spontaneous remission. So when we provide patients with treatment that prevents the signs and symptoms of chronic spontaneous urticaria, it is with the, with the aim, with the goal of having them symptom-free until it is gone. Our treatment has to be so good that our patients will forget they have chronic spontaneous urticaria unless they forget to take their tablets or to get their shots. That's the aim, that's the ambition, it's a big ambition, but I hope we can show you how we can, how we can meet this goal. And really, we wouldn't be all here if it weren't for new treatment options we have. Uh, after all, this is what we're trying to break. We're trying to keep our patients urticaria-free, wheel-free, angioedema-free, itch-free, and those are the targets that we can go for. We can go for the cause, yes, that's possible in some patients. We can work with the trigger, yes, that's possible with some patients, but it's clearly not the majority of patients, which is why in the past and now we're using antihistamines and other drugs that target individual mast cell mediators that drive the disease. All good, but insufficient in most patients. As you know, um, most patients 
uh, will not be symptom-free using these approaches, whereas now that we can go for the main driver of UT carrier reactions, the mast cells, the activating mast cells, uh, the signals that lead to mast cell activation, and the whole group of mast cell mediators that, that make these signs of symptoms, now we finally are getting where we want to be, and that is providing good prevention, complete prevention to our patients. After all, we'll be talking about omalizumab in your hands, in our hands, uh, since uh, this year, based on a program that I should say is comprehensive, the biggest UT carrier program ever in the history of this planet. It is a program that's driven by academia. We must say that, and we as dermatologists should be proud that it was academic dermatology that pushed for the inside that developed the ideas, the hypothesis, and the vision to have this drug as a urticaria drug. And you will see today um, that this is the disease that this molecule was made for, even though it was licensed for asthma a long time ago. It's a urticaria drug. Well, it also works in asthma. <laughs> but it works 10 times better and 10 times faster in chronic urticaria um, as compared to asthma. And this is uh, now in our toolbox because of dermatology, because of European dermatology largely. Okay, what does that mean for you? You have to stay and, and listen to what we have for you, but it also means that we want your feedback, your feedback on these uh, uh, lectures and uh, on what these experts have to tell you. Uh, most of them I don't have to introduce to you. Clive Grattan um, uh, and, uh, and Anna, you know from, uh, from a long time for their long-standing interest in urticaria and their expertise and everything they've done for the field. A name that you may have not heard before is Donald's name. I'm very happy that uh, he agreed to be here. He's the man behind the numbers. He has looked at all the numbers that we have uh, very carefully, and he came up with some really interesting stuff that we wanted to share. So um, we're glad, Donald, that you, that you could make it, and we're looking forward to what, what you have to tell us. So how many urticaria patients, all urticaria patients, do you see in your clinic, in your, in your private practice per month? Is it no patients? Is it less than five or including five? Is it five to ten or more than ten patients? And when you hear the music, which should be... Uh, you have the chance to vote. And please do. And those were 10 seconds, and those are your answers. It shows you that, uh, so most of us actually, the, oh, let's say the majority of everyone who is here sees definitely more than 10, uh, uh, or, or sees uh, five, more than five patients per month, so a large part more than 10. You are in the right symposium, so that's good. Now, next one, one more. How many of your patients are symptom-free with H1 antihistamines. I'm not going to ask, but this is the, the number one uh, or the preferred treatment of choice that every one of us uses. How many patients or how many of you have patients? Uh, now, how many of your patients are symptom-free? Is it 25% or more? Is it 50 or more, 75% or are 100% symptom-free with H1 antihistamines? Please vote now. Those were your 10 seconds, oh, somewhere in the middle, around 50%, 50% or more, but clearly, uh-huh, here, some and some who are treating obviously very severe cases where almost no one or no one responds to H1 histamine. I think it makes clear that we need better treatment options than H1 antihistamines. They did get better over the years, no question. Um, we are glad we have them, but we need more, we need better drugs. Uh, to provide uh, good prevention to our patients.